history and identity. And she holds, oh, I already said that part. Um, so by day, she currently lives in San Francisco and works for an education company that supports public school districts. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Rachel. Um, and do you have slides for your talk today? We can have you go ahead and share them. I do, I do. Go ahead and do that. Also, hello everyone. Thank you for having me here today. I am so excited to meet you all. Um, also, I always, always mix up Tayo and Kame, so I appreciate that. Okay. All right, are you seeing my screen? Okay, all right. So my name is Rachel Lucero and I am really, really excited to be with you all in this space today. I've been reflecting a lot because um, of the news in Atlanta and hearing about the hate crime that occurred. And I just wanna affirm that if you are like feeling some type of way about that, it is okay to give yourself grace. I you know like in the science world, kind of just, you know, we're like always going. And so it is okay to, you know, give yourself grace today. I am really excited to talk to you today about sort of my journey exploring culture and uh, Filipinx history and my own identity through food on the Sago Show, which is my YouTube channel. This is a picture of me very intensely making empanadas. Let me introduce myself because I haven't formally met um, each of you before. I was born on Chinook land, also known as Vancouver, Washington, and I lived in Washington state uh, up until I was 22 years old. So uh, now I, I live on Ohlone land in what is known as San Francisco and I work for um, an ed tech company. Also my parents immigrated in 1985 and let me just throw this in there. I'm an Enneagram 5 wing 4. And usually in spaces that I'm in, no one else is Enneagram 5. So I'm hoping that presenting to you, maybe, maybe there is one here. <laughs> I also want to brag a little bit because I am here with you all and you're all very impressive uh, scientists uh, about my former life studying bioengineering. And sometimes it makes me feel better if I at least get to say, oh, I did BS Bioengineering at UW, thank you. Uh, feel like I got my money's worth, but I at least get to see it. Uh, I, but I, I took all of that stuff after I graduated and I went into the classroom. I was a math and physics teacher for 10th, 11th and 12th graders. It was um, some of the hardest but also most rewarding years of my life. I, was, uh, I did my mathematics education masters at Johns Hopkins and now I uh, just work an office job. I <laughs> currently work at an ed tech company in San Francisco. And I also created the Sago Show, which is uh, my YouTube series that I'm here to talk about mostly today. Oh, we got someone from Bellevue. Hello. And you'd have undergrad too. Oh, nice, nice. I love it. Go Huskies. So. I will start off by giving you a little bit of background on how the Sago Show came to be. Um, it was in 2019 when I was finishing up my master's degree and you know dreaming of like, what am I gonna do with all my extra time after I'm done with my master's? I um, came up with a 2020 resolution for myself, which was that, okay, each month in 2020, I'm going to learn how to make a different Filipino dish, and I'm gonna look up the history on that dish, and then I'm gonna document it on YouTube. This is my New Year's resolution. And the first one was adobo. And I had not made adobo before, um, or I hadn't made it very many times. I had done like slow cooker adobo in, in college, but not really a lot of times. So I called my mom and I was like, can I please have Lola's adobo recipe? And she went through her recipe box and um, my Lola has passed away. So it was really special that she found um, a handwritten note card with Lola's recipe, with Lola's handwriting. And so she texted me a picture of that and I started to follow her instructions. Um, but also as part of my resolution, I wanted to learn about the history behind adobo. 
and the origin. And I asked my mom, um, hey, do you, what do you know about the history of adobo? I wanna know. And she was like, oh, Spanish, I guess, because of the name. And that was also what I had assumed. And I had very limited knowledge of Filipino food at the time. So she said that and I continued like working on adobo, perfecting it. I was FaceTiming her and she would like look at my sauce because she lives in, in Washington. And so she's like checking out my sauce, like helping me with the timings and stuff. And in between kind of all these things, I take out my laptop and I just look up history of adobo. And um, this is what I found. And you might have already seen an article like this or information like this before. Um, but this was one of the first articles that I read on origins of adobo. And I had thought for basically, you know, in, in many, this affected many of the things that I, I thought um, that adobo just existed in the Philippines because it was brought by the Spanish. But it was really the other way around. And for several decades now, there have been food historians and scientists that bring forth evidence that uh, suggests that this method of preparing adobo, so cooking a meat or something else in, uh, in as an acidic component like vinegar, um, that had existed in the islands that are now called the Philippines before the Spanish arrived. And a Spanish food scientist, so the one that's mentioned in this article, Borges Sanchez, he found that he was studying these 16th century Spanish books that had documented how were uh, people of the Philippines cooking. So it's a really, really early cookbook. And it documented a process by which the native people were cooking meat in uh, native vinegars, so cane vinegar, coconut vinegar. And this method of cooking was given the name adobo by the documenter. Um, so this sets up the argument that people of the Philippines were cooking meat in vinegar before Spanish arrival and that the method was actually just assigned the name adobo because that was what the Spanish were recognizing in that method of preparation. Because Spanish was the colonizing language, that's what we call it now. And that completely shook my view. <laughs> my, my very narrow understanding of Filipino, Filipinex history led me to be really oversimplified in the way that I perceived our food. And in my head, things were really black and white about food. Like there's things that have Spanish influence, and then there's things that are native to the Philippines. There's, you know, pepper and some influence from Chinese traders, also the US occupation. And I really struggled to explain to other people what is Filipino food because I didn't know how to capture all of that. There's like so many influences. Didn't know how, how do you explain that to someone? Especially, yeah, well, I'll get into it. So. On top of that, I really struggled to explain myself. And I have a Spanish last name and a lot of my teachers in my you know, super white suburban hometown like grew up thinking that my parents immigrated from Mexico, not from the Philippines. And I really realized that my view of myself was so oversimplified as just a byproduct of colonization that I really lost sight of how rich the cultures, cultures, plural cult cultures in the Philippines are. Um, and we are more than just islands that were colonized, but cultures that persist, even though there have been centuries of imperialism. And so adobo is also one of those dishes that everyone prepares really differently. And there are so many regional differences, like some put coconut milk, some put eggs. Um, and I think adobo is a really beautiful representation of tradition that has unfortunately been overridden by like colonizer branding due to its name. This is like, I found this out in like a whirlwind of, of cooking one night. And from that day on, I knew that the Sago show had to be much more than a cooking show. So 
on the Sago show, I talk about on each episode a different Filipino dish. And uh, I talk about how history and imperialism touches the following things. The ingredients, the way it was prepared or is prepared, um, the time of day or time of, you know, in life when we eat it, and also what we call it and what it's named. So I'll give you some examples. The first one, so ingredients. Halo Halo is a really um, interesting example because yes, obviously it's, it is a mixture, but there are many different influences in Halo Halo. Leche flan being uh, Spanish originating, the red bean and the ice being um, brought by Japanese settlers. And then on top of that, you have native ingredients like lanka and makapuno, the jackfruit and coconut. And so there's so much there in just the ingredients that you can break down. Second, the way that it was prepared. Pies are a very interesting element in Filipino food, I think. Um, I don't have time to go into like this entire thing, so you can watch my pies episode if uh, you feel called to. But um, one of the ways that pies got introduced into Filipino society is through the American education system that was imposed on Filipinx people. And um, when the Philippines became a US colony, there were, I think 500 to 600 American teachers who got on a ship and came to the Philippines to basically duplicate the American education system in the Philippines. And one of the things that they taught was home economics. Um, and it was in those classes, they're teaching uh, Filipinx children, this is how to be hygienic. This is how to make American food, including pies. And it's interesting, they would stress like using uh, canned, canned American canned ingredients instead of native fruits. Um, okay, the third thing, what we call it, uh, Arroscaldo is Spanish in naming, but uh, you might know that it more originates from Chinese settlers and it was brought by Chinese merchants, yet we call it Arroscaldo because of the dominating language. And lastly, when we eat it. Um, a lot of the foods that we eat at parties, like the fiesta food, like paella, leche flan, and samada, a lot of those are Spanish in origin. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that when you think about who was, who was having parties during the Spanish colonial period, it's the Spanish, it's the wealthy, the upper class. And so their foods are the ones that got uplifted traditionally as kind of the, the finest fiesta foods. So imperialism, and there's like a lot in history that just touches the ingredients, the way it was prepared, what we call it and what and when we eat it. Yet at the same time, all of these foods are uniquely Filipino, they're unique to us. And even though they have external influences, this is Filipino ensamada, this is not Spanish ensamada. So native ingredients and one's environment are affecting the version of this dish and over time it is evolving. And I think that's why Filipino food is really, really interesting to me because the more that you pick apart the elements, the ingredients, like its influences, how you prepare it, you can piece together a little bit of that history. And as I created each episode, sort of the, the dots started to get connected for me. And I grew pretty sad uh, just not knowing what history had not been documented or what history had already been erased. And there was a lot that I realized I just never got in my traditional K-12 schooling. And um, to describe what it felt like, it's like you're waking up to new memories and I didn't wanna forget the memories anymore. So that's why food's important to me. It's so personal and it tells a lot of stories. You can tell stories about yourself, about your family um, and about people that came before you. So when people ask me, what is the Sago show about? I say it lies at the center of food and history and identity because I see them very intertwined. 
This is a page from the zine that me and my sister created that is like a mini cookbook of all of the Sago Show recipes. And I'm showing this because I, I think if you come away with anything from this, I want you to know how inextricably linked these three things can be. And for me, I've loved food my entire life. Like I feel like it's a part of me. Um, it's a way that I felt comforted and a way that I feel like closer to home, closer to my family. And through working on the Sago show, I feel that connection even more. Okay, so thank you for listening to me today and having me here as, uh, as a guest. I am linking or listing a few key articles that, I, uh, that are related to the topic of um, adobo's origins, as well as two amazing books um, Tikim and Taste of Control, if you are interested in learning more about Filipino food. And of course, you can find me on YouTube, The Sago Show. And yeah, again, thank you so much for having me here. For coming and for giving that great talk, Rachel. Um, I wanted to ask, <laughs> I'll start with questions. Um, have you always been a, a chef, a cook? Um, and just started to pick up this challenge because of the pandemic or, um, or did you just start your cooking journey from this? Yeah, um, my husband just joined, this is funny. I used to be, a re I used to be really, really bad at cooking. Um, I did not actually like, I know a lot of people have the experience of like cooking with their parents um, growing up and like, you know, all the recipes and that wasn't my experience and it wasn't until um, kind of after college that I started to really start to cook. And that was because I was, I actually left Washington and, um, I lived in Wisconsin for a little bit and I lived in Washington, DC for a little bit. Uh, and being far away from home, I think it made me, it made me think like, oh, I need to know how to make these things because I can't just go home and get it. Um, and so it was after college actually that I really started to try to make an effort to learn my parents' recipes because I no longer could just go home and get them. I have a follow-up question to that. How often do you find that your parents' recipes actually line up with what you find online? Because they never do for me. Like I always have to call my mom for her very specific adobo recipe because the, the ones I find online are super weird and they don't do what my mom did. And you know, how often do you find that mismatch and are some of your recipes that you show, you know, unique to what your parents were doing? I love that question because, oh, uh, so uh, it really gets me. Um, I'm gonna go back to this adobo picture. First off, to answer your question, um, yes, there's so much variation from what I find online versus what my parents do. And I think that that can sometimes be a reason that deters folks from wanting to cook Filipino food because it's like, oh, like my parents or my family made this a very certain way. And I need to, the way I made it like doesn't taste like how they did it. So, you know, why, why should I even try making this? At least that's how I felt. Um, and with the adobo recipe, this is, my parents want everyone to be clear, this is not just like Lola's recipe, it's adapted. <laughs> um, and so this, this recipe is like my version of adobo, but adapted from my Lola's. And I think that it is really important for us. I'll just speak for myself. It was really important for me to know that like I can make Filipino food, even if it doesn't taste exactly like my parents or exactly like my Lola's. Um, it is okay. Like we have access to different ingredients. We have, you know, we just are going to prepare things differently and you, what you're making is no less Filipino just because it tastes, it tastes different. The fact is that like every dish has so many variations and it's going to taste really different. It is pork belly. Yeah, so I had a question. 
So I'm actually like that. Well, in, like interested in like food facts as well. Before I cook something, I always like search up like the history or just some sort of fact about the food that I'm cooking. Um, and then I post it in my Instagram after I cook it. <laughs> but uh, so I'm just curious because, you know, we you talk about the context of Filipino food has a history, but actually many other foods, obviously, like they have histories as well. I mean, in the U.S., like donuts are different in every state <laughs> as in the same thing as like the Philippines, there are different regions. Maybe they have different versions of, let's say, adobo or something like that. But how can you get someone like interested in like that kind of history? Because I actually do think it's like important, especially in like the context of people thinking like, like, oh, cooking something is cultural appropriation. I mean, like you got to understand, which I, I do get, you know, that part's um, of that. So I'm just wondering your thoughts on how to get people like, I feel like it's important that people just know the history of food or where it comes from or, you know, those interconnections and stuff like that. Yeah, that is a good question. Um, I honestly think food is such a an accessible way to get people interested in history too. Um, I guess first, this doesn't answer your question, so I'll get to it. But um, I am not like a history person. I've not. I hated history in in high school. I just like never paid attention. I was like, whatever. Uh, Ivy U.S. history. Like I don't care. Um, and food is something that I'm really interested in. And so when I looked up the histories behind the dishes, like they directly applied to me and my family, and I could like feel. I felt something very special in looking up these histories because I felt very like personally connected to them and knew that, you know, these were things that affected my family, my ancestors. Um, but I guess to answer your question, I think like when people hear things like, oh, like, did you know that this was actually this before? Um, or like, do you know why this is the thing? Um, I think that usually just like a little bit of information helps them like want to dig deeper. I don't think that perfectly answers your question, but thanks for it. Oh, I know. Yeah, yeah. I kind of, it was a blur, like a blob of a question. <laughs> so thank you. I have a question, Rachel. Yeah. Um, so the Sago show is really awesome. I, that's why I was really excited for you to come join us today. Do you have any plans beyond the Sago show to continue uh, like teaching folks or like maybe, you know, combining everything you've learned into like a book or something or just, you know, expanding beyond the YouTube channel? Yeah, um, I'm currently working on, so I have two seasons down of the Sago show. I'm currently working on a third one which um, I haven't said this yet, but it, it's all about coconut dishes, um, dishes that have coconut in different ways because coconut's such an important recipe, or sorry, an important ingredient in a lot of our recipes. So I'm looking at, um, you know, the future episodes, of course. I uh, am right now restocking the little zine cookbook um, which is called the Sago Show Visual Companion that uh, my sister illustrated and has um, a little bit about what I talked about today and all of the recipes. And yeah, um, it is on my website. I'm going to be restocking it in a, in a couple of weeks. I'm going to purchase so a few of those, just saying. <laughs> Thank you. I have been really, really overwhelmed with just the community that I think that, that I have met through this whole process, um, connecting with you, Gabe, connecting with um, just folks on Twitter who are also interested in this topic um, has made things like really well worth it for me in this whole experience. Hi, Rachel um, and Carla, I wanna say, Thank Hi. you for coming and um, presenting about the Sagu show. And um, I really like, I really like how you actually um, connected 
Filipino food with imperialism and really just naming that. Because um, if everyone doesn't know, um, March 15, 15, 21 was actually um, the day when like the, the Spaniards came into the Philippines in Mactan in Cebu. And that was like exactly 500 years ago. And this is just like a very fitting um, talk to really um, talk about history. Um, Cause I see that, you know, like I actually grew up in the Philippines um, and just moved here to study. But even in the Philippine um, education system, these are not really talked about, you know, like how food is actually affected by how we are um, being colon uh, we were colonized before and how um, even like, yeah, what well, you mentioned about the name, the ingredients. And I actually think food is kind of like oral history in itself. I could, I could parallel that because it's like, because in, in the Philippine um, historical documents, you don't see a lot of things. Like it's a lot of dates. It's a lot of like when um, the colonizers came, what they did. It's actually mostly just glorifying them in, in a lot of ways, but not really like how they have impacted um, the erasure of our culture and also just like claiming a lot of things in our culture or integrating um, their own Western um, culture to, to efficiently colonize us and to pacify us, um, our people, our ancestors. So I think this is a, a really good way um, to talk about history. Um, it's, it's even like a document in itself. Um, and, and like what you said, it's like, it's where people could relate easily because like Filipinos love to eat a lot, even in <laughs> and everything. Um, but yeah, I really appreciate it. And I think, I think my message really was just like, I hope it goes beyond food actually. Like what we talk, when we talk about um, imperialism and, and food, we also talk about how um, that impacts us economically, socially, um, and how even right now we're still kind of like colonized in a lot of ways um, by the different systems and how, you know, like we as a country don't really have um, self-determination in our own, even though technically it was said in paper that we are free as a country, but there's a lot of, um, a lot of things that we still need to talk about um, in the aspect. So thank you for coming. Oh. Carla, you have me thinking so many things. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I'm thinking about like the way that things in history get get framed to us. Like um, I put this in the zine, but like when I was when I was in elementary school, I knew that the Philippines was a US colony, but it was just like a one-liner that I just knew like, oh yeah, the, the Philippines was colonized by the US. Mm -hmm. And it's like one line in a textbook or it's just like, yeah, it's just known. But did I really challenge and think like, what does that mean though? What does that mean for me right now? What did that mean for my Lola who um, had to say the Pledge of Allegiance in school? Um, and so, I think there's so much power in education and like the way that you frame things to youth. Uh, it just impacts everything. Um, and also I, I really fear for like loss of documentation of like even our recipes. And so part of this too was that I wanted to document the way that my parents cook things, my way that my Lolo and my family cooks things so that uh, I can just preserve that. I saw a question from Precious. Um, adobo is the name that Spaniards gave adobo, but do we know what our ancestors originally called it? Um, so I believe, and I think you might have to check the article, but the, the, um, the documented word at the time was like the origin word of quinilao, um, which is also cooked in, a, in an acidic component. So you'll have to check. Can you so I have a, I have, I have, oh. Go ahead, Carla. 
So, um, Kinilo is actually a, a meal or addition of Visayas too, because I came from Cebu. Um, but it's mostly like you use just vinegar to actually cook like a fish, um, and we just eat them directly as raw fish cooked through vinegar. Gabe? Uh, I was, yeah, I was going to ask um, through all of this as well, have you felt a more deeper personal connection to like? your your family or like your grandma and your mom like like Carla was saying our or like you were all saying is like our food are like our oral stories passed down and by cooking do you are you like finding like this deeper un connection or like a, a new understanding of like when your mom or like your family would cook for you are you uh, finding these kind of like more you know personal things yeah uh, I feel like emotional I think that something that I like think a lot about now learning to cook these dishes is that my mom and dad came to the States and they moved to Vancouver, Washington. There's like not a lot of Filipino stores. And then like to be removed from food that you really like and you feel like you grew up eating and then suddenly you can't make it the same way. I think it's, I feel more connected to that struggle. I had a quick question. Um, so how come it's called, or you decided to call the show The Sago Show? Or like, what, what, what made you decide <laughs> that name? Um, oh, it's a little in the weeds, but so, so the Sago Palm, um, it's like the pith that you actually use and you grind up and make into like sago pearl or that you use the starch that's in the in the center of the palm pith and I wanted to I I, I think sago should like sounds good but also I think that that process of like extracting the thing that is within is metaphorical for what I wanted to do on the sago show because you like really decon like pull apart and dig within and like what is behind the dishes so it's kind of just like a it's like, it's a food extraction, a history extraction, an identity extraction. Um, I have a question. So uh, what's your favorite dish to make and why? Um, I love this question. I love to make seasig. Um, I, so I said before I was like a really bad cook. I thought seasick was out of reach, out of reach for me. Like that just seems way too hard. And when I learned how to make it for the show, I was like, oh, I can do this. I just like couldn't stop making it. I made it for my family. Uh, it is such a crowd pleaser when you bring out sizzling seasick and you put it on the table. Um, I just feel like it's really impressive, <laughs> and it's very tasty. I, I I wanted to just be known really quick. That is how I found Rachel when I googled. Seasig, that's one of the ones that came up. So that's how I found Rachel. Wow, I'm so happy to hear that. I guess as a follow-up question, what's the most challenging dish that you've had to make? Oh, um, any, so I tried to have a balance of savory and sweet dishes, like ones that require baking and, um, the ba I'm not a baker. I have friends that are bakers. It's like, it's really hard. And um, Ensamada was a really tough episode to work on because like, I don't know how to make bread. I just, I think it's really difficult. So I actually had a friend, a bread expert come and do that with, do that with me to help me consult on making bread. But any of my baked goods I have had to, or any of my baking episodes, I've had to practice like three, four, five times before I actually have one that's filming worthy. Um, another question, Rachel, can you take us kind of through your production process, like how you come up with the episode or the recipe or the story you want to tell and kind of how you go from, uh, you know, idea to storyboard to final release on YouTube? Yeah, well, the way that you put it together makes it seem like I if you if you only saw what was kind of going on in my in my uh, home studio, um, 
the first season, um, I just picked literally like six of my favorite, six of my favorite dishes. I'm going to learn how to make them. It was kind of random. And as I found more about, uh, found out more about the history behind the dishes, there was like a specific sequence that I wanted to put them in that kind of told the story across six episodes. Um, and so each of them build on each other and like call back to previous episodes. So um, in going into the second season, the second season actually is all about um, the 20th and 21st century Philippines and America. So it's recipes that um, have something to do with the America or have something to do with Americans in the Philippines and Philippines in the US. Um, and so I like there to be an overarching theme. Um, the actual like filming and gosh, practicing of everything is sometimes like quite a separate job <laughs> because I have to practice things a lot, get the okay from the family. Does this look right? Um, then actually film it uh, in my kitchen um, and then I also record a voiceover over it. Found out that editing takes a long time. Um, and then I usually try to have all of those ready to go out um, week by week. So hopefully I'll have season three ready soon. Those will come out for your, any coconut lovers. But I was laughing because um, I, I don't have like professional stuff. So I'll have like, I have a light fixture that I will put on like I need it to be tall to shine on the food. So I'll put it on a stool and then put like a paper towel holder and then like like three books on top of that. And that's that's what you don't see. We gotta get Rachel sponsored. I know, right? <laughs> If, um, if we don't have any more questions, again, thank you, Rachel, for coming on to Kumustahan. Um, for the last, oops, I don't know, seven or so minutes, we'll all just have announcements and then I'd like to take a group picture of all of us here today. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So um, I have to ask, can you all see my screen? <laughs> Okay, um, Natalie, I'm gonna call you out here for this new um, office hours. Can you give us a, a little bit of details on that? So every Friday, there's an open Zoom room for office hours for AFSA. So if you just wanna co-work or sit with people as they also do work on Friday nights, it's open from eight to 10 p.m. EST and it's dropped in the Slack if you haven't seen it. And it's also in the newsletter. But that's like the new thing happening as of like two weeks ago. So it's just like an open space. Like you can pop in and out. You can work for as long as you want. You can just come to not work also. That's it. Cool. Thanks, Natalie. Okay. And then Friday the 19th, our education committee meeting is at 7 p.m. EST, led by Fred, who is the committee chair. And um, we're going to be deciding that day what journal club um, article we'll be reading for next week's Kumustahan, sorry, two weeks from now's Kumustahan uh, for our monthly journal club. Um, there's also a book club meeting on Saturday the 20th. The book is Jar of Hearts by Jennifer Hillier. Hillier. Um, I don't know who's in it. Are, are you in it, Natalie? Yeah. yeah. You unmute yourself. <laughs> um, cool. And then um, the publicity, uh, committee meeting is Saturday the 27th and then I also alluded to the Education Journal Club. The article is still to be determined for what we're covering in a couple of weeks. Okay, does anyone else from any other committees have any announcements to make? Give the floor to you. Shaking heads. Okay, no. Can I, can um, I say really quick? Yeah. Uh, Fred, put the link in the uh, chat earlier but you know as you saw Rachel gave a really fantastic talk and you know we are trying to find uh, other speakers this is a great space if you'd like to practice um, you know giving a presentation sharing stories about your passions or just sharing something that you have interest in or even practicing if you've got a conference or something coming up um, please use 
the um, the link and register. It's as you can see, it's very easy. No need to be nervous. We're all big group of uh, friends here. Uh, we're happy to give feedback and ask really fun questions. And if you you know if it's if you want to give a talk about like superheroes in the Philippines, do that. This is just a really great space for you to practice no judgment and just have fun. So please do that. If you have any questions about things, you can send me an email. I'm happy to help workshop talks as well. Um, so yeah. This is a great chance if anybody's interested. Cool, thank you for that. Carla, you looked really inspired when he said Filipino superheroes. Did you have one in mind? <laughs> no, I, actually this morning I was thinking of getting a tattoo and I, I saw a lot of like Greek mythology and I, I've been looking at um, Adlao and there's another name of, of someone who's actually the Visayan god of the sun. And they have really cool tattoos and I want, I want those. So I'm like, yeah, maybe we could talk about them, you know, like the ancient um, goddesses and gods. And, well, but by if, and the gender you neutral. <laughs> so I don't know if you can see, but I've got a traditional tattoo that's um, Lumawig's uh, symbol. Um, from the Philippines. I got it done in traditional way by Lane Wilkin. If you all are interested, I could have him come and speak for a Kumustahan one day. He's he's a friend of mine. Yeah, please, please do. Okay, I will try to set that up. Cool, thank you. Gabe. Okay, so as we wrap up here, um, I'll take a group photo. Okay, I'll count down. Get ready with your smiles. Three, two, one. Okay, sweet. All right, well, we have a couple more minutes till it's officially 5.30, but if anyone has to go, you're free to go. Um, but again, thank you so much all for coming and Rachel for giving your awesome talk.